Again, take your Bibles and find the Song of Solomon, chapter 3. Song of Solomon, chapter 3. We'll look at verses 6 in chapter 3 to chapter 5 and verse 1. Uh, this morning we continue our series, What the Bible Says About Marriage, Love, and Sex. And today we come to some pretty steamy scenes in the Song of Solomon. So we've been leading up to the wedding, okay? Let me just kind of give you the context. We've been talking about love. We've been talking about marriage. We've been leading up to the wedding. Uh, but when, uh, when you have a wedding, you have a wedding night, okay? When there's a wedding, when there's a marriage, there's a honeymoon. And so this is what follows chapter 3, verse 6, really beginning chapter 4 and then into chapter 5 and verse 1. And so we've got to, uh, I promise, I'm going to be careful today, but we're also going to examine the Word of God and see what the Bible has to say this morning about one of God's greatest gifts. And that's the title of the message today, one of God's greatest gifts, one of God's greatest gifts. Marriage, love, romance, courtship, dating, sex, all of these are wonderful gifts of God. Listen to what pastor uh, and author, teacher, Dr. David Jeremiah says. The Song of Solomon is the Bible's case study of a plan for all seasons, courting, dating, engagement, and life together for the rest of our days. But I need to warn you. The deepest joys of marital intimacy are detailed here. And he's talking about this text specifically. And he says the emphasis on the word detailed. Uh, we pastors tend to gravitate away from such passages as this one. But it's, listen carefully now. But it's time to stop letting a confused world carry the dominant voice on such an important issue. It's time to take back the beauty of sexuality for God's people as He intended it. So this morning we're going to talk about the subject, one of God's greatest gifts, and specifically we're referring to the physical relationship, marital intimacy, the sexual relationship between the husband and the wife in the context of marriage. And we'll dive into Song of Solomon chapter 3 and verse 6. We'll walk through the text and we'll see what the Bible has to say about that today. One of God's greatest gifts. So today... I brought on stage a gift, nothing really special, nothing really important, just a, a wrapped box, and this is a gift, okay? And, and I want you to know this morning, God has given you and me some gifts in life. There are all sorts of gifts, okay? And we'd be here all day if we were talking about the gifts that God has given to us, because everything that we have that is good comes from God, that's what the Bible says. But you need to understand, and I need to understand that your marriage is a gift from God. Did you know that? You're thinking, wait a second, you don't know what my marriage is like. Listen to me carefully. Your marriage is a gift from God. Your purity is a gift from God. Did you know that? A wonderful gift. Marriage and love, dating and romance, sex, all of these things are gifts from God. But the world tells us to do something different with these gifts than God does. God says you take care of them. You open these gifts at the proper time, you use them in the proper way, and these gifts are wonderful and amazing things. But you know what the world says? The world says, it doesn't matter what you do with these gifts, it's really not a big deal. So you can just shake it around a little bit. Could you all hear that? Is that okay? You shake it around a little bit, and it doesn't really matter what you do with these gifts, right? You can uh, drop it, and you can uh, you know, kind of kick it around. And the, the world kind of says that this is really not a... Not a, sorry, it's not really a big deal, right? It's not, not really that important. Teenagers, you know, everybody's doing it, so you might as well, too. That, that's what the world says, right? And so what begins to happen is we take these awesome things that God has made, and we use them in ways that He didn't intend. And the truth is, sometimes this can happen in our marriages. Sometimes this happens before marriage. Sometimes it happens beyond marriage. And all of these things that God has given us, we begin to use and abuse in ways that He doesn't, didn't ever intend for us to. And that's when problems and difficulties and all sorts of issues come in. But I want you to know the gifts that God has given you are amazing and incredible, wonderful gifts. And when used in their proper context, are indeed some of the best gifts that God has provided for his children. 
Now, I want to be clear this morning. God offers grace. God offers forgiveness. God offers restoration. God offers redemption. But I promise you, it is best to follow God's plan in the first place. It's best to follow His manual for marriage, to to follow His standards for sex in the first place, instead of having to be forgiven, repaired, restored, follow God's plan in the first place. So you you may wonder, how can a pastor even talk about something like this? Well, the Bible talks about it. And so since we believe the Bible, since we preach the Bible, since we teach the Bible, we're going to talk about what the Bible has to say. And parents, I'm going to tell you, I think the church is the second best place in the world for kids to learn about this. And, And the first place they ought to learn is in the context of a godly family. But the reality is, let, let's just talk about this for a moment. The reality is, by the time a kid graduates from high school, he'll have seen no less than 14,000 depictions of and references to the sexual relationship. 14,000. And you might say, well, you know, a lot of that is education in school and, and teaching them, you know, all of the, the right ways and, and to avoid this and that. You know, of the 14,000 references, only 165 are accounted there. The rest of them, whether it's in music, whether it's in movies, whether it's on the television, whether it's on Netflix, whether it's on social media, 14,000 references to and depictions of sex. And many parents don't want sex education in schools. And I can understand because of what they teach them in schools. But the reality is we don't teach them anything about it at home. So I would say we're going to talk about it and... uh, we're going to discuss it and see what the Bible has to say. Planned Parenthood. You've recently heard Planned Parenthood in the news. This is not a godly organization. You understand. Planned Parenthood gave us a, a, a statistic. They ask the young ladies who come in for an abortion, how many of them did their parents have genuine conversations with them about marital intimacy and the physical relationship? Less than 5% of young girls coming in for abortions had this kind of conversation with their parents. And we wonder why we're in such a mess. As David Jeremiah says, we cannot let the world be the dominant voice any longer. God spoke about it. The the Bible speaks about it. And the church remains silent. So the world is screaming while we keep our hands over our mouth. But the Bible speaks of it, and that's what we'll talk about today. So on on one hand, here's the problem that we face. On one hand, you've got uh, the culture that says it's no big deal. If it feels good, go for it. No standards No issues about morality. You just run out there and grab whatever you want, whenever you want, and it's not a big deal. There's nothing sacred about this at all. And so men and women have adopted this this practice. Then on the other hand, you have the church, and, and, and for a while the church has treated the sexual relationship like it was something evil and wrong. In fact, Jerome, who translated one of the Bibles, the Latin Vulgate, this is uh, this is real, this is true. Whenever he experienced sensual desire for a woman. He felt it was evil, so evil that he, would, uh, he was in the practice of throwing himself into a thorn bush to overwhelm himself with physical pain. So men, if you plan on doing that today, wait till you're off the property, all right? Another guy, well, the, the church in the 6th century began to limit the days when marital intimacy was permissible. By the time they were done, they'd eliminated over half the year. Martin Luther said this. Martin Luther said, intercourse is never without sin, though God mercifully excuses it by its grace. In other words, the church has said this is wrong, this is evil, and this is bad. And God has gotten a bad rap. Far from being seen as the inventor of this wonderful thing and the giver of this great gift, He's seen as the suppressor of it. What does the Bible have to say, though? The Bible says that God has given us some amazing and wonderful gifts. And when we use these gifts in the right way, at the right time, according to His plan and purpose, you would be amazed at the wonderful gifts that God offers to His children. So we're going to talk about it today. I mean, the Bible talks about it. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 18 to 19. Listen to these words. Rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts satisfy you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always with her love. Now, how many of y'all uh, learned that verse in Awana? Anybody? Anybody? 
But that's the Bible, right? This is the Bible. This is what God is saying. Just before that, he's saying, you know, hey, drink from your own cistern. Drink from your own fountain. Purity, marital fidelity. So we're going to dive in to see what the Bible has to say. And I want to say this before we do. It is because God and the Word of God have such a high view of the sexual relationship that God says it ought to occur only in the context of a biblical marriage. It is because God has such high standards because in reality, any any sexual relationship outside of marriage devalues genuine love. And this is what the Bible has to say, and so we'll dive in and see what it has to say. In fact, those of you who may be single, I want to encourage you. The, the, the studies have shown, you, you, people think these days we can just live together and everything will be all right. We'll figure each other out and then we'll get married down the road. Do you know people that live together before they get married are 80% more likely to get a divorce? Because people think if we do it our way, it's going to work out. But God has the way. He's got it figured out. He invented this thing, so we need to follow his manual and his standards. Number one, I want you to notice in chapter 3 and verses 6 to 11. Number one, this gift that God has given us, it is planned within the context of a biblical marriage. It is planned within the context of biblical marriage. Chapter 3, verses 6 to 11, describe a beautiful procession that's taking place. Chapter 3, verses 6 to 11, there's all sorts of stuff going on here. But what, what really is happening is King Solomon has pulled out all the stops. King Solomon is coming to get his bride. Look, look at chapter 3, verses 6 to 8. What is that? This is the lady speaking now. What is that coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, just kind of billowing up from the wilderness, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the fragrant powders of a merchant. Verse 7, Behold, it is the litter of Solomon. Around it are sixty mighty men, some of the mighty men of Israel, all of them wearing swords and expert in war, each with his sword at his thigh against terror. By night. Now, in those days, a little different than what we experience today, the groom would go in a procession to go get his bride. He was coming with all of his homies to pick up his girl, right? And so Solomon was on the way and he was headed straight one direction to go get his girl. And Solomon didn't come just like any regular groom, right? Solomon came like the best of the best. I mean, you got to remember, this guy had all sorts of money. He was super wise. He had everything at his disposal. So the, the groom would go, all of his friends would go with him. They'd go get her at the house and then they'd take her to the wedding ceremony. Now the Bible says here, this was an incredible procession. Solomon came, look at that word now in verse 7. It is the litter of Solomon. That's an interesting word, okay? It doesn't mean a litter of puppies. Although some of you ladies would think that's adorable, right? You'd be like, oh, how sweet. No, it, it, the litter of Solomon is, is uh, it's like the carriage. It's the, the couch that he sits on. So Solomon's sitting up there on the couch. And the guys, the 60 men around him, somebody's carrying this couch. And they're taking Solomon to his girl. And she looks out and she sees him coming. She's like, who is that coming up here? Oh, there's the couch that carries the king. He's coming for me. And then and look at verses 9 and 10. King Solomon made himself a carriage from the wood of Lebanon. He, he made its posts of silver, its back of gold, its seat of purple, its interior. It's inlaid with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. In other words, get the picture in your mind. Solomon is coming up to claim his bride. He's, surrounding by his, by, he's surrounded by his entourage. He has 60 groomsmen with him, and all of them have a sword. He's like, baby, I can take care of you. Don't you worry. Security. He's saying, with me, you're safe. And here he is, headed down the road. Some of the mighty men of Israel. He's big. He's bad. He's making a statement. He's coming for his bride. And when he pulls up, it's almost like he's saying, I did all this for you, sweetie pie. How about that? Pretty amazing, right? Pretty amazing. Not only that, he's got the best vehicle money can buy. Verse 9 and verse 10 tell us he's got the best of the best. This is the Rolls Royce in those days. The best of the best. Look, at it. the Bible says the carriage is from the wood of Lebanon, some of the best, most treasured wood of the day. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's silver and gold and purple, and its interior is inlaid with love. How did she know that it was inlaid with love? I have no idea. 
Maybe it was pretty or maybe she could just tell. This guy's coming and he's coming in the best of the best. He's arriving to get me and I feel loved and appreciated and valued. In other words, this is an amazing stretch limo. And he rented it. Well, he owns it, all right? He's got all the money anybody wants. So he owns this amazing stretch limo, the best vehicle money can buy, built especially for this occasion. And his sweetheart sees him coming. What is coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke? And then in verse 11, she's telling the daughters of Jerusalem, hey girls, he's mine. She tells them that. Oh, oh look, this is, this is, look upon King Solomon. There's my man. So in, in other words, this is what's going on. The girl looks down the road, down her driveway, and she sees her man driving down. And he's got the best of the best. Sixty guys in his entourage, right? All of them are, are armed to the teeth. And he, she knows that he's coming for her. And she's talking to her girls saying, oh my goodness, there he is, he's on the way. And Solomon pulls up in the stretched limo, rolls down the tinted window in the back, pulls down his sunglasses and says, hey baby. How about me and you get married today? That's what's going on. I mean, this is amazing. Like Solomon is so excited to pick up his bride, to take her to the wedding. And she is amazed and astounded by his love. Incredible. And this is a biblical marriage. This is, what, this is kind of the way it would happen, although this is lavish and ornate. Uh, there were children who were asked about marriage, love, and romance. And here are a few of their responses. One of the questions was, how can people make love last? A little boy named Josh, age eight, here was his answer. How can people make love last? Don't forget your wife's name. That will really mess up love. That's what <laughs> Josh said. A little boy named Alan, age 10. How do you decide whom to marry? This is what Alan said. You got to find someone who likes the same stuff. Like if you like sports, she should too. And she should keep the chips and dip coming. That's what <laughs> Kristen asked that same question. How do you decide whom to marry? She was age 10. No person really decides before they grow up who they're going to marry. God decides it all way before. And then you got to find out who you're stuck with. That's what Kristen said. <laughs> when asked, how can a stranger tell if two people are married? Derek, age 8. How can a stranger tell if two people are married? Married people look, usually look really happy to talk to other people. That's what he said. <laughs> Eddie, age nine. How can you tell if two people are married? You might have to guess better. You might have to guess based on whether they're yelling at the same kids. That is how you might know <laughs> that they're married. What's the proper age to get married? A little girl named Catherine, age eight. What's the proper age to get married? Catherine said, 84. <laughs> because at that age, you don't have to work anymore, and you can spend all your time loving each other in your bedroom. That's what Catherine said. <laughs> Parker, age 10, was asked, when is it okay to kiss someone? Parker, age 10, said, you should never kiss a girl unless you have enough bucks to buy her a ring and a DVD player because she'll want to watch videos of the wedding. <laughs> Very interesting. What, what we see here in these verses is the beauty of marriage, love, and sex in the context for which they are to be enjoyed. No, notice now, notice the phrase there, there toward the end, verse, verse 11 at the end of chapter 3. On the day of his wedding, on the day of the gladness of his heart. Is that how you view the day of your wedding, the day of your marriage? Is that how you view your relationship now? The day that brought me joy, the relationship that brings me joy, the marriage that brings me joy and gladness of heart. So, first of all, we notice, we notice that marriage... Marriage is the context for which God gives us these wonderful gifts and blessings. Number one, it's planned within the context of a biblical marriage. Number two, it is provided as a gift from God. It is provided as a gift from God. This is the whole point, really, today. This is the whole point of the message. And, and you might not remember much about what I say, but you'll probably remember me kicking the box around the stage, right? Talking about how important it is for us to follow God's plan and purpose and to follow God's design for the gifts that he's given to us. And far too often we abuse those gifts 
instead of following his plan. In these verses, uh, the Holy Spirit pulls back the curtain. Chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 7. He pulls back the curtain and we are given a very intimate glimpse Not just into the wedding day, but the wedding night. This is an awesome and beautiful thing. And listen to me carefully. It should be dealt with delicately and with great care. And so as I walk through, that's what I'm going to try to do. He begins by extolling her beauty beauty in chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, behold, you are beautiful, my love. You are beautiful. He repeats it over and over again for emphasis. Those of you who have told your wife that she's pretty, if you've ever done that, I want to encourage you, do it again, okay? You need to do it again. You need to do it every day. You need to do it every morning. Yes, even when she rolls out of bread with bed with morning breath and messed up hair, tell her that she's beautiful and that you love her. Here he says over and over again, you are beautiful. You are beautiful. He doesn't stop telling and listen carefully. He doesn't just tell her she's beautiful. He gives specifics. Chapter 4, read with me verses 1 to 7. Behold, you are beautiful, my love. You are beautiful. Here it goes now. You ready for this? Your eyes are doves behind your veil. You know, in those days they would wear veils. You normally didn't get to see a lady's eyes. Your hair is like a flock of goats. <laughs> Leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing. This is important now. All of which bear twins. And not one among them has lost its young. This is Solomon complimenting his bride. Now, your lips are like a scarlet thread. He doesn't mean I want to tie your lips shut, men. All right? And your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of pomegranate behind your veil. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. I have no idea what he's talking about. Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Verse 6, until the day breathes and the shadows flee, I will go away to the mountain of myrrh and the hill of frankincense. I'm, he's saying, I'm going to find my delight in you. Verse 7, again, you are altogether beautiful, my love, and there is no flaw in you. He's complimenting his bride, and he's giving very specific details of the things that he loves. Now, I'm going to be honest. These compliments, like we've seen, don't really make sense in our culture today, Right? You, you don't call up your wife after driving down a country road and say, Baby, I just passed a field full of billy goats. And I want you to know they all remind me of you. Uh, you just wouldn't do that today, right? Like, your cheeks look like fruit. I mean, now, now these days we have compliments like, uh, you know, Hey, you've got buns of steel, right? Abs of steel. One, one day down the road in the future, that probably won't make sense to anybody. But, but here he is. He, he, he says, I really like your teeth because you have them all. That's what he said. Did you notice the text? Like your, your teeth are like shorn sheep that come down from the field. All of them bear twins. Not one has lost its young. You have a mouthful of teeth and I love you for that. that that's what he's saying. I mean, and in those days, that was a much bigger deal because you just didn't go down the road and see a dentist, right? That was great. So he's very complimentary of his bride. And your your neck looks like the Eiffel Tower, you know? That is, I I don't, I think in those days, especially if you you remember uh, from history in Egypt, especially those days, long necks were considered ornate, beautiful, and and gorgeous. So these lines probably don't work today, but there are some lessons to be found, okay? When we talk about the marital relationship and marital intimacy, I want to give you two practical tips. First of all, the wife is prepared verbally. Men, listen to this. Verbally. The wife is prepared verbally. He is very specific with his praise. For for ladies, listen to this now. For ladies, marital intimacy begins with the ears and heads to the mind. So he's very specific with how he praises her and speaks to her. He's complimenting her. He's being very tender. He's being very loving. Chapter 4 and verse 7, what does it say? You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. He's saying, girl, you are perfect. You are a ten. 
you look good. Is she perfect? No, she's not perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect bride. Don't elbow your spouse. There's no such thing as a perfect husband. What he's saying is you are beautiful. You are perfect for me. I, I don't believe there are any perfect spouses, but I do think there are perfect matches. And I think you need to pray and find the perfect match for you. Chapter 4 and verse 7, he's honoring her. He's showing her, you're beautiful. You're a perfect ten. Then he tells her again, your, your, your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle that graze among the lilies. Some of you are like, did you really just read that verse again? I did, and here's why. Here's why. I want to tell you, this speaks of tenderness, of love, of care. You see, we have a family of deer that live behind our house. They live in the woods by our house. And some of you like to deer hunt, okay? And, and you know, and most of you know, if you want to be able to see deer, like we've seen the deer come out of the woods, and there they are standing in our yard. If you want to see the deer, you do not do this. Hey, deer, there you are! Right? Because what happens if you want to see the deer, and you run up there like a crazy person saying, Look, deer! Ask one of our kids. They do that all the time when they see deer. Right? That's not, if you want to, you got to be cautious. You got to be careful. You got to be tender. And you got to be slow. And this is what he's saying. This is what the Bible's teaching us. Men, nod like this if you understand what I'm saying. Yes, this is what the Bible's teaching us about how you're to love your spouse. Ke Kevin Lehman wrote a book, Sheet Music, which I think is very, uh, very clever title. He says, guys, we have a problem sometimes because we approach the sexual relationship in marriage like it's a football playbook. We got our favorite play, and it worked at the game last week, so we're going to run that play again. And so we come up to the line of scrimmage, down, set, hot! And she's got the defense up, and it's just not going to work. He said, I don't understand. I don't understand. I scored a touchdown on this play last game, and now I'm stopped for a loss of yards. This doesn't make sense because women are a mystery. Right, ladies? And women love variety. You know that? Like, guys, how many shoes do you have? About three, three pair of shoes? About three. One for work that you can wear to church, one for the yard, and one for play, right? Ladies, how many shoes do you have? Thousands of shoes in the closet because one pair of shoes doesn't work for every occasion and another pair of shoes doesn't work for every other occasion and another pair of shoes because you go through that variety in your mind over and over and over and over again. So guys, you have to constantly learn her. God made it this way because, guys, a lot of times when we think we've accomplished something, we think we've won, we, we chased her, we got her, she said yes, we married her. Now we no longer have to conquer to win her heart. You just thought you had her when you got married. You got a long way to go, big boy, to figure out what's going on in that brain. I'm just telling you, you got to learn her. You got to study her over and over and over Again, it's not at all like a football playbook. It doesn't work that way. Verbal complimenting, verbal, verbal encouragement is huge. Kevin Lehman says, guys, it's not the same. You're not going to the same game. She's not the same person she was on Tuesday versus Saturday. you got to understand that. So we see that the, the wife is prepared verbally. Next, the husband is prepared visually. And ladies, you're like, well, duh, you know. I know that already. Did I come today to figure that out? Well, remember carefully, though, what I said a minute ago. For the lady, it starts with her ears and heads to her mind. Now, ladies, listen carefully. For a man, it starts with his eyes and completely skips his brain. Okay? It starts with the eyes and completely skips his brain. For the lady, the ears are what she hears is important. For a man, it's what he sees. Notice how visual these verses are. All these verses that I read a minute ago, they're all visual. It's about what he sees about her. He's describing what he sees. He's prepared visually. Now, let me ask you a question. How many, how many single men do we have here? Single men. Raise your hand up high. Single men. Okay, men. Listen carefully. 
one day, one day, you're going to ask a girl to marry you, and you will be dumbfounded, amazed, and pleased when she says yes. You will be like, yes, finally. I begged long enough and pleaded long enough. She finally said yes. I'm going to get married. Now, I want to give you some advice. When it comes to the wedding day, shut your mouth. <laughs> she has been dreaming about this day all of her life. When it comes to the wedding day, you stand where she tells you to stand. You do what she tells you to do. You smile and you nod and you say, yes, ma'am. Men, because she's been dreaming about this day all of her life. She's got every detail planned down to the, the last moment and instant and everything is absolutely the way it ought to be. And if you, if you give her your opinion, you're going to mess up her perfect day. Shut your mouth. How many single ladies in here? Any single ladies? All right, single ladies. We got a few single ladies. Ladies, can I give you some advice? One day when you say yes to this guy, you're going to get married. And he ought to keep his mouth shut about the wedding day. But I want you to know something. When it comes to the wedding night, you got a guy who's been dreaming and hoping and praying for that day all of his life. He's been thinking and wishing and wanting and talking to the Father, begging him, please give me a wife. Please, Lord Jesus. So you need to know, he's got a dream in his mind as well. And guys, guys, if you keep your mouth shut for the wedding day, you'll probably have a better wedding night. You see, marriage is this wonderful and amazing gift that God has given to us. And we need to understand how to enjoy it in the context of the proper relationship God's given us. Number three, it's purposed for love and enjoyment. It is purposed for love and enjoyment. So it's provided as a gift of God. It's planned within the context of a biblical marriage. And it's purposed for love and enjoyment. Marital intimacy is a wonderful gift from God. Listen to what he says here. He, he begins to invite her to come with him. He says, come with me, my bride. He just wants to have her close, chapter 4 and verse 8. I want you to be with me. In fact, what he's saying is, you are going to be with me from now on. We are going to be together from now on. This is the permanence of, of the marriage relationship. He's mesmerized and captivated by her. Chapter 4 and verse 9. You've captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You've captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes, with one jewel of your necklace. By the way, go back a chapter and find out where the necklace was. He's amazed. He's mesmerized. He's captivated, as that great country group Alabama would say, I'm guilty of love in the first degree. Lock me up and throw away the key, right? He is captivated, mesmerized by her love with just one glance of her eyes. Sounds like love at first sight, right? When I saw your eyes. Sounds like love at first sight. Chapter 4 and verse 10. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. How much better is your love than wine and the fragrance of your oils than any spice. Your love is better than wine. He's intoxicated by her love. Your love is better. It's better than Old Spice and that disgusting Axe body spray. That's what he's saying. Your love is better than all of that put together. Your love is better than wine. Wine doesn't last. The effects of wine don't last. The effects of wine are intoxicating. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to give you permission to get drunk this morning. Are you ready? Get drunk on love. That's what the Bible says. You ought to be intoxicated with their love. Get drunk on love. Be intoxicated. This is... The fragrance of your oils, the fragrance of your garments. This is amazing. It's an experience that takes in all the senses. Sight, hearing, touch, sound, smell, all of these things. Is extolling the wonderful relationship that God has given them in the context of marriage. I heard about a couple who wanted to celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary. The couple returned to their honeymoon hotel. After, uh, after heading up to the hotel room, the wife said, Darling... Don't you remember when you used to just stroke my hair? Won't you stroke my hair again? So he began to stroke her hair. She said, don't you remember when you used to snuggle up to me and, and, and hold me tight? Won't you, won't you hug, hold me tight again? 
So he began to squeeze her and hold her tight with that. She says, sweetheart, don't you remember when you used to nibble on my ear? You used to nibble on my ear. Don't you remember that? Won't you nibble on my ear again? With that, the husband got up off the bed and walked out of the room. The wife was so upset. She said, what are you doing? Where are you going? She said, baby, if I'm going to nibble on your ears, i got to go get my teeth. <laughs> the Bible tells us that God has given us amazing and wonderful gifts. God wrote the manual for marriage, and he set the standard for sex. We follow his plan. Listen to me carefully. Young people, married people, single people, senior adults, God knows best. God knows best. Number four, and finally, it is prized as pure and holy. It is prized as pure and holy. So this gift that God gives us in the context of marriage, first of all, it, it is, it's planned within the context of biblical marriage. It's provided as a gift from God. It's purposed for love and enjoyment. But finally, it is prized as pure and holy. We see this in chapter 4 and verse 12, all the way to chapter 5 and verse 1, the end of our text today. In verse 12, the, the figure of speech changes. Uh, in verse 12, he begins with a new metaphor. He, he says in verse 12, A garden locked is my sister, my bride. A spring locked, a fountain sealed. sealed. Now you get the image in your mind as, as you read this. Here's a garden, and, and the garden is filled with plants and spices. It's filled with fruitfulness. It's filled with fragrance. Wonderful and amazing things are in this garden. But this garden is not just for anyone. This garden is locked. This garden is sealed. This fountain that provides refreshment, that, that provides enjoyment, that provides nourishment, it's not just for anyone, it's locked up, it's sealed. This spring is locked up, it's sealed. You know the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 that you are God's field, you are God's garden. Did you know that? And so you and I are called to be sealed, to be locked up, to be reserved only for the Lord Jesus Christ and then only for the person whom God would have you marry. That means you are God's farm. You are God's garden. He saved you and you became God's beautiful plant. You belong to Him. He says a garden enclosed, a garden locked. The garden is not just for anybody. It's got a wall around it. This fountain is not just for anybody. It's got a wall around it. It's sealed up. The spring is locked. It has a cover on it. Nobody can drink of this spring except the right person. This is the way King Solomon says to his wife, you've kept yourself just for me. Speaks of purity and intimacy in marriage. This is another Bible argument for monogamy. One man, one woman for one lifetime. This is a biblical argument for fidelity and for purity. And students, young people, singles, it's a biblical argument for keeping yourself pure until marriage. Be a garden locked, a spring sealed. So that you can enjoy it in the context and the way in which God intended. Listen to me carefully. And those of you who are single especially need to hear this. Not everyone is living a promiscuous life. This is not a situation where everyone's doing it. I might as well. Listen carefully. Those of you who are married. Not every spouse is having an affair. Not every spouse is on Ashley Madison. Not every spouse is going looking for love in all the wrong places. You remain pure and faithful to your wife, to your husband. You, those of you who are not yet married, make a commitment that whoever that will be one day, you are sealed up from now until then. You're going to be faithful. It's prized as pure and holy. And look at what it says here. She can say to her husband, let my beloved come to his garden and eat its choicest fruits. You can enjoy. Now she's opened the gate. Why? Because she had the key. It was locked. But she gave him the key to her heart. Come in and enjoy the fruit and the fragrance of the garden. It's a beautiful picture of what happens in the marriage relationship. Faithfulness, folks. And it's a picture of how we ought to be faithful to the Lord in our relationship with Him. 
Eve was suspicious that Adam had another woman. Adam said, Eve, you're the only woman in the world. How could I have another woman? Eve couldn't help it. She was still suspicious. So when Adam was fast asleep, she leaned over and started counting his ribs. <laughs> hey, you know, when I was younger, the True Love Waits movement was really big. And, and that's the purpose of this movement is, is great, and I appreciate it. Sometimes I think they went about some things the wrong way. One of the things that they would do in, in a conference or to illustrate the importance of purity is they would take a rose just like this. And they would take a rose, and what they would do is they would pass the rose around and just let everybody handle the rose, touch the rose, and they would start pulling off all the petals of the rose. And they would talk about how when you fall in love, when you compromise your purity, when you don't use God's gifts like you should, this is what begins to happen. You begin to, to tear these things apart, and you begin to fall apart, you begin to be broken. When you compromise your purity, all these things, and they would take the rose and they would pass it around, and by the time the rose got back to the people, it was, uh, it was a mess, it looked a lot like this, it was broken and tattered and, and torn, and they would, then, then they would say, you know, this is what they would say, see this rose, who wants a rose like that, that's what they would say, but I, wanna, I want you to listen to me carefully as we finish, who wants a rose like that, who, who wants a person like that, that's what they meant. Who wants a rose like this? Can I give you an answer? Jesus does. Jesus does. Jesus can take all your brokenness and your tattered life. Jesus can take your mistakes. Jesus can take your pain. Jesus can take your heartache. Jesus can take your impurities. Jesus can take it all, and he can make it brand new. Now, yes, sometimes you give up things that you can never get back, but he can restore the joy and the peace and the happiness and the purpose. Listen to me carefully. Who wants someone like this? Jesus died for someone like this. For you and for me. Because in the end, the truth is, all of us are broken. All of us are full of sin. And Jesus can take a rose like this. And he accepts it just like it is. And he can make you whole. He can make you whole again. So my final word today, while I want you to hear me clearly, embrace purity in God's plan. There's been a time in your life or a moment where you've made mistakes. Life is not over for you. God has a plan. He has a purpose. And it is beautiful, amazing, and wonderful. God uses people who are broken, who are wounded, who are tattered and torn, because when he does, he gets the glory.